tonight, Albertans take matters into their own hands to save their homes from wildfires. There was no boots on the ground. We didn't see a helicopter or a water bomber for two days. While evacuees are told they can go home for now. Things go sideways. We may not be able to get back in there to protect them. Donald Trump appears on the very network he spent years attacking. You perhaps are given an agenda or you have an agenda. And the Canadian who helped pioneer AI on the very real threat of artificial intelligence. I think people are ultimately excited to hear from you and a bit afraid. Should they be? I think there are things to be worried about. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. We begin in Alberta tonight where thousands of people are allowed back into homes in areas where the wildfire threat has subsided for now, but the danger is far from over. Here's a map. Here's a look at the situation tonight. Dozens of fires are still burning across the province. About 24 of them are out of control. That threat looms large near the town of High Prairie, whereas Aaron Collins shows us some people say they've had to fend for themselves. Saturday night on Highway 749 was chaos. Just south of High Prairie, Alberta, farmers here usually focused on seeding or calving in the spring, fighting for their homes this year. We fought this until it was too dangerous to be here any longer. We had to pull out, but... So you got trees burnt here. The house is fine, but then if we just, you know, sort of shift our gaze to the other side of the yard... Yeah. Different story for the shop. Yeah. An unimaginably close call. This fourth generation farmer used to relying on family and neighbors, but not like this. Pitching in with professional firefighters working around the clock to save their homes from a relentless wildfire. All these guys out here, everybody with a tractor, disc, dozer, a shovel and a rake, they threw their boots on in the morning. They didn't leave. They sat here and they fought for what they had, their farms and their houses. And that's what really stopped this thing. But not everyone in the area agrees. At this town meeting in High Prairie, tensions are high. <laughs> Anger over a lack of help from the province and the county for residents fighting fires here. There was no boots on the ground as far as professional firefighters. Nothing. We didn't see a helicopter or a water bomber for two days. That's a problem that could soon re-emerge. Officials warning the weather could be about to turn. The north of the province remains warm and dry. Tomorrow we expect low humidity and high temperatures in the northern boreal, which could make wildfires more active up there. Back near Highway 749, the work hasn't stopped. A mix of provincial, private and county crews are digging in, getting ready for the hot weather in the forecast. Well, residents here are preparing too. Oh, it'd be nice if it was out, but this is a sleeping giant in the bush here. Uh, like every day we're fighting it, there's new spots flaring up again. Wake up in the morning and there's fire in the bush in your front lawn. You go out there and hit it with a garden hose. All too aware that it will just take a spark to bring the chaos back. Aaron Collins, CBC News, near High Prairie, Alberta. Now let's head to Edson, west of Edmonton, where evacuees got the news they were waiting for. They can finally return home. But as Julia Wong tells us, they could be facing a tough decision. It was a small town hall with big news for evacuees west of Edmonton. Hundreds who have been out of their homes for more than a week altogether will be allowed to return for this reason. We know, as we spoke yesterday, that we need to live with the fires. They're, they're here, so we don't want to keep you away. Officials admit it's a calculation after facing days of pressure to let people go home. We are balancing your right to use your property to the extent that you can with our responsibility as a municipality in a state of local emergency to protect your safety. This particular fire is burning just under two kilometers from the community, but the county mayor supports the reentry plan. There are some upset people uh, out in the county. We understand that. Williams understands there have been tensions about not being able to go home. And with firefighting resources stretched thin, he worries there won't be enough help if people choose to stay. Things go sideways. We may not be able to get back in there to protect them. And at, and at that 
point, they're on their own. This resident says she's happy to go home. It makes sense, you know, like, yes, it's our property. We have every right to be on it, but safety comes first. If the north wind picks up, but with the fire being only three quarters of a mile out of town, uh, we could be evacuated again tomorrow night. While other residents like this man say they aren't sure if they will follow a future evacuation order. Christians believe that to obey the laws of the land, but they're also God wants us to use our own good sense that he's given us and his directions. A couple dozen houses have burned down in this county, so it's a big deal for residents to come back and see what's still standing, and for some to get back to their farms. The bigger issue now is what things will look like in the coming days, with temperatures in the 30s on the horizon. Julia Wong, CBC News, Lobstick, Alberta. Turning now to the U.S., where for the first time since 2016, Donald Trump has returned to a CNN stage for a live town hall. The event comes at a time when both Trump and CNN are trying to expand their reach. But Trump quickly returned to his old ways, refusing to accept the result of the last presidential election and saying CNN may have an agenda. Susan Orison joins us now from Washington. So, Susan, Trump faced some tough questions, but clearly he remains defiant. Yeah, a Trump town hall on the network he called fake news for years was bound to be dramatic. But with that sex abuse verdict just a day ago, in Donald Trump's live exchanges with the CN moderator, he mocked the verdict and the trial. What do you say to voters who say it disqualifies you from being president? Well, there aren't too many of them because my poll numbers just came out and they went up. <laughs> okay. But for E. Jean Carroll, who won her case against Trump, the verdict was worth it for all women. There's a sort of a feeling of victory that at last somebody has held him accountable in a courtroom. Former President Donald Trump. Despite the timing, CNN had already taken a lot of blowback for staging a live town hall with Trump answering to an audience of Republican and independent voters. I wouldn't interview a man who has used live interviews to incite violence and tell lies who has in the past encouraged violence against CNN itself. There has never been a greater dereliction of duty. Republican Liz Cheney released a new ad warning of normalizing Trump as an ordinary candidate. Donald Trump is a risk America can never take again. Trump had refused interviews with CNN for seven years and had furiously fanned a nasty feud. When you report fake news, which CNN does a lot, you are the enemy of the people. CNN is fake news. I don't take questions from CNN. John Roberts of Fox. Let's go to a real network. But that was then. Trump has now soured on his former Fox News family. Donald Trump does not like Fox News. That's where you start. He feels they betrayed him. At the same time, new leadership at CNN is trying to pull the news network towards the middle of the political spectrum. When we do politics, we need to represent so both the question sides. Is, by I way, think it's important I, for I America. So Trump seized the moment, still boasting he's a ratings maker. CNN is rightfully desperate to get those fantastic Trump ratings back. They made me a deal I couldn't refuse. Why should Americans put you back in the White House? That was a rigged election, and it's a shame that we had to go through it. It's very bad for our country. It was old familiar Trump bulldozing through, falsely calling the 2020 election rigged, promising to pardon those convicted for crimes on January 6th, and promising to end the war in Ukraine just like that in 24 hours. Classic Trump, leaving no doubt, Adrian, that he is who he was. So, Susan, the moderator was calling Trump out on his lies, but his supporters, you know, didn't seem bothered by his lies, just applauded him. Well, that's because the audience was almost all Republican supporters who will vote in the New Hampshire primary uh, about nine months from now. It wasn't a balanced crowd, which is why CN CNN took some flack and why it's still taking flack for doing this. We did hear tonight from Joe Biden, who tweeted, you want four more years of that? And then ask for donations for the Biden-Harris campaign. All right, Susan Ormiston in Washington, thank you. Welcome. Another prominent Republican is under fire tonight, including from within his own party. Congressman George Santos pleaded not guilty 
to a string of federal charges. As Chris Reyes tells us, it appears his lies may have finally caught up with him. He's coming out the door. From the courtroom straight to the cameras. All right. We made it here. Look at this. Released on a half a million dollar bond, Congressman George Santos came out swinging. I'm going to fight my battle. I'm going to deliver. I'm going to fight the witch. Hunt. I Santos is battling 13 federal criminal charges, including money laundering, lying to Congress, and stealing public funds. Excuse me, guys. He's also accused of setting up a company to defraud his political donors. Are you considering resigning? No, I'm not. And unlawfully receiving unemployment benefits. On all of that, Santos was defiant. I have plenty of evidence that we will now be sharing with the government in this case to make sure that I can defend my innocence. Santos is defending his name against more than just the indictment. He's accused of a long list of other lies, that his mother died in the 9-11 attacks, that he worked for prominent Wall Street firms, that he was a college sports star. Santos. All of that surfacing after he won his New York district in last year's midterms. Santos has only admitted to embellishing his resume. Some in his party say they've had enough. My belief is that George Santos needs to go. Uh, he needs to resign. He's an embarrassment to our party. He's an embarrassment to the United States Congress. Here at Congressman Santos' district office in Queens, the doors are locked, nobody inside. We haven't seen anyone all afternoon, but his constituents have a few things to say. I think he's a liar and he's a cheat. And the more I read, the more I get crazy, and I can't wait till he just leaves. He should resign. He should take it on the chin and go away, far away. On that, Santos was clear. Are you planning on running for re-election? Yes, I am. Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy says he won't endorse that bid, even as his party isn't stopping Santos from going back to Washington right. to vote on key bills supporting the Republican slim majority. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Thousands are gathering on the southern U.S. border as a pandemic-era immigration policy is set to expire. Katie Simpson is at a crossing in Texas tonight where so many people are facing uncertainty, including many children. From a distance, you can tell U.S. Border Patrol has someone in custody. Closer to the well-worn footpath on the American side of the wall, it becomes clear. It's a little girl, all by herself. We don't know how she got here, but on the other side, there's a woman and another child. As they surrender to Border Patrol, the child gives a little wave. Officers shout back and forth about where to meet for a reunion before taking them to an immigration processing center. All day long at the border wall, record numbers of migrants are apprehended, searched, and loaded into vans. There is great concern this will intensify. Thousands of migrants are on the Mexican side of the border and may try to cross once the COVID era rule, Title 42, expires Thursday at midnight. It allows border agents to quickly expel migrants. We are clear eyed about the challenges we are likely to face in the days and weeks ahead, which have the potential to be very difficult. With shelters full, migrants had already been staying on the streets of El Paso, though in the last 24 hours, many have decided to surrender to authorities. For those who stayed, conditions are difficult. So when a vehicle full of donated clothing shows up, supplies run out pretty quickly. Local volunteers are happy to help. And if they're just hardworking people, and you know, it's just like a, as most immigrants in this world do, when they come in, if they follow the laws, they have a great chance to come up in life. Arepa, arepa, arepa. Marion Castro hasn't decided if she'll turn herself in before Title 42 expires. I am frightened that if I turn myself in, that they will expel me, she says. Castro and her three kids under the age of 10 fled Venezuela after she says her husband was murdered by government officials. I want a place where I can have a job, she says, because I know here is where I will find a future. Katie, you and the team have been on the ground for a few days now. What stands out to you about how local officials are talking about this moment? It's something the mayor said, Adrian. He was asked, you know, what's keeping him up at night right now? And he said the fact that he can't see any light. And what he means by that is he doesn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. 
This is a moment of a problem, of a challenge that isn't really going away. There are times when the number of migrants crossing into El Paso surges, and then it eases off, and then it surges once again. It happens in a cycle. There's no real ending in sight. He says that the only way this challenge can really be dealt with is through new laws and policies in Congress, and he's not really optimistic that's going to happen. So from his perspective, this moment can be managed, but he doesn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, this is tough. All right, Katie Simpson, thank you. Thanks. A court in Pakistan has ruled that the country's former prime minister can be held in custody for eight days to face questioning on corruption charges. That decision comes amidst a second day of violent protest. At least five people have died in the clashes across the country after Imran Khan's dramatic arrest yesterday. He has denounced the charges. And hopes of a ceasefire in the Middle East are being dashed tonight. Rocket fire and airstrikes continue between Palestinian militants and the Israeli military. As Margaret Evans tells us, it is some of the worst fighting in months. Gaza's skyline, once again dotted with plumes of smoke left behind by Israeli airstrikes, along with sound and fury. On Tuesday, Israel targeted three senior Islamic Jihad commanders in Gaza, accusing them of planning attacks against Israel and calling the strikes pinpoint. But at least 10 civilians, including four children, were also killed, according to Palestinian authorities. This morning, there were more airstrikes, aimed, according to Israeli officials, at weapons bunkers and launchers. Islamic Jihad responded by firing hundreds of rockets towards Israel, leaving Palestinians bracing for a response. There is general anxiety, says this 30-year-old Gazan. As you can see, only a few people are on the streets. They certainly feel that a war is coming. There's tension, whether here or among the Israelis. It's the same feeling of fear. In Israel, air raid sirens sounded from Ashkelon all the way to Tel Aviv. Many of the rockets fired from Gaza were intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome defense system, and Israelis were told to stay close to their bomb shelters. It's frightening for us to run to shelters, and I think it's terrible for Palestinian children who don't have shelters as well. Tensions escalated last week after the death of an Islamic Jihad leader on hunger strike in an Israeli jail, prompting cross-border attacks from the Gaza militant group answered by Israeli airstrikes. Hamas, Gaza's ruling militant group, has backed Islamic Jihad, but so far reportedly not engaged itself. But it is a cycle that can easily get so much worse all too quickly. More than two million Palestinians live in the narrow Gaza Strip, under an Israeli and Egyptian blockade imposed 17 years ago now. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Ottawa has announced the passport is getting a makeover with some new features and some new images. They erased Vimy Ridge to put in an image of a squirrel eating a nut. Why the new design is stirring up a bit of controversy. Robert got the first tour of three licks in. New concerns for hockey players who dropped the gloves. What we found was the enforcers were dying a decade earlier than their peers. And an emotional response to being mocked on the ice. People make mistakes, right? And, and uh, it's just a time for everyone to learn. We are back in two. Fire destroyed a house west of Toronto after a car crashed into the garage. It took firefighters an hour to contain the flames. Police said no one in the house or vehicle were hurt. They are now investigating what led to that crash. So soon, you will be able to renew your passport online. The federal government also unveiled a big redesign. As Olivia Stefanovic tells us, not everyone is on board. The federal government calls its new passport design a celebration of national identity. 
But the opposition has a different description. Erasing Canadian history. There is history missing. And when you want to know where you're going, you have to know where you're from. The overhaul replaces historical moments introduced by the former Conservative government with everyday scenes of nature. They erased Vimy Ridge to put in an image of a squirrel eating a nut. The Royal Canadian Legion calls the removal of the Vimy Ridge Memorial a poor decision. It represents great sacrifice, the kind of sacrifice that really led to our being able to use a passport and travel around the world today. The new travel document doesn't include any tributes to veterans. Even an image of Terry Fox is gone. So there's a couple images here. The MP for Nunavut says she's happy to see more diversity, but not at this cost. Both Terry Fox and veterans are very important uh, to our identity as Canadians. Outside the passport office, reaction mixed. I believe uh, that's part of our history, so I do believe it should remain. We should be able to bring happy, fun, new aspects to yeah, like all parts passport. of Canada, including passports. We're going to continue to deliver for the veterans every single day. The Liberals defended their redesign, pointing out the images need to change every 10 years to make the document harder to counterfeit. You should not read into it that there's some criticism or dissociation with our, our nation's heroes or our veterans. The new passport begins rolling out in the next few months, just as the current 10-year passports begin to expire. To deal with the surge, the government is launching a new online renewal. Canadians can pay their application fees and upload a photo on a secure government website. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. A teaching assistant in British Columbia says she is at risk of being fired over her social media presence and how she's been supplementing her income with an OnlyFans account. Susanna De Silva looks at the case and what could happen next. Kristen McDonald's online job is now threatening her day job. I shouldn't be told what I can and cannot do with my private time. During the day, she's a high school special education teaching assistant. In her private time, the single mom has a side hustle. As a education assistant, we don't make a livable wage. Um, you have a, a, most people in my profession have second, third jobs. She created an account under a different name on OnlyFans, a subscription-based over 18 website where she creates soft porn. But she also has public accounts under the same persona where she posts in lingerie and bikinis. I didn't link any email or phone number, whether it be personal or uh, related to my profession, to any of my socials. But someone complained, and she says the school district told her to stop posting. It told CBC News it could not comment on individual employees. The union supports her, saying there is nothing in the collective agreement around this type of conduct and that wages are the real issue. I mean, maybe the uh, school district should be addressing that issue more so than trying to police people's uh, off-duty conduct. But the district has a code of conduct that says employees must remember they are role models within the community and must not engage in activities which may negatively affect the district's operations, reputation or work environment. It absolutely raises questions around who is a role model and who isn't and the legality of those opinions. This employment lawyer says she can see a case for both sides, but it could be considered discrimination. If she loses her job, she might have an argument that she lost her job because of something related to gender expression. That would be an interesting case to run. McDonald, who is currently on medical leave, says she will fight to keep both jobs. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Google has unveiled the next evolution of chatbots in a race for AI supremacy, but it's that very race that has a former employee concerned. If we produce things that are more intelligent than us, how do we know we can keep control? Why the Canadian who helped pioneer AI now warns it could get too dangerous. And the pay disparity playing out in hospitals. It can be demoralizing for the, um, the regular staff. Having to do the same job, but getting less pay. The massive costs to fill a labor shortage. The National takes you deeper into the story, shaping our world. Next.
Well, this is Sam Altman. He's the CEO of a major artificial intelligence company called OpenAI. They are the developers of ChatGPT. Well, tonight he has agreed to testify on the dangers of artificial intelligence. Altman is set to appear in front of a U.S. Senate panel on the matter next week. His testimony will be one of many aimed at creating new regulations for the industry as it continues to evolve at a rapid pace. Hearings in Washington are a start, but a slow start for tackling a reality so critical. The Canadian-British AI pioneer Jeffrey Hinton says he feels a duty to shout his concerns from the rooftops that the threat of unbridled AI is a threat to existence as we know it. Sounds a bit otherworldly, doesn't it? Let's figure this out together. Jeffrey Hinton, the sometimes called godfather of artificial intelligence, is trying to explain its risks to the world. This is just something somebody sent me from Twitter. Which means explaining something very real that can sound entirely made up. I'm lost, I don't know. He's eager for good communication of the urgency, and look who might be offering it, Snoop Dogg. It's, it's blowing my mind because I watch movies on this as a kid, and I heard the dude that, the old dude that created AI, is talking about, this is not safe because the AI's got their own minds, and these motherfuckers gonna start doing their own shit. I'm like, is we in a fucking movie right now or what? <laughs> the fuck, man? Do y'all know? <laughs> That's what people are saying, is like, are we in trouble? He gets it. He's smart. You're not offended he called you the old dude? No, I call myself the old dude now. <laughs> Imagine working your entire adult life to build a better future. I think we're going to see the learning methods we've got already have dramatic effect on many industries and solve lots of problems. Where computers and machine learning make life better for humans. These chatbots answer complicated questions, draft emails and speeches, then realizing that the creation is nearing a point where it could do a type of harm that cannot be undone. That's the realization that hit Hinton when he was working for Google. Because of his job, he couldn't talk, so he quit his job, and now he talks. I caught up with him in London a few days ago. I think people are alternately excited to hear from you and a bit afraid. Should they be? I think there are things to be worried about. There's all the normal things that everybody knows about, but there's another threat that's rather different from those, which is if we produce things that are more intelligent than us, how do we know we can keep control? And what tends to happen when... Well, if we're talking about evolution, all these species are evolving, and what tends to happen is it doesn't go well for the less intelligent species. The other one kills it? Not necessarily. Ants look after aphids because they produce honey. Um, but Ants are in charge. Ants are in charge, yes. Ants, in this analogy, in case that wasn't ominously clear enough, are not the humans. It made me realize that these digital intelligences have something we don't have that makes them much better. When one of them knows something, it can tell all the others that's what we don't have with people. So imagine you had 10,000 people, and imagine if when one person learns something, everybody knew it. You could learn a lot more stuff, right? right. And that's why things like ChatGPT knows like 10,000 times as much as any one person. It's because when you train it, there's lots of different copies looking at different bits of the data and learning stuff, and they can all combine what they learn instantly with a bandwidth of like trillions of bits. So can they think? Yes. So imagine the following scenario. I'm talking to Chatbot, and we talk for a bit, and the answers it's given me seem a bit strange to me. And I suddenly realize that it thinks I'm a teenage girl. And I say, what demographic do you think I am? And it says it thinks I'm a teenage girl. Um, so the question is, when I said it's, I suddenly realize it thinks I'm a teenage girl, was that a metaphorical use of the word think? Or was that just the same way as we use think? And I strongly believe that use of the word think, when I said it thinks I'm a teenage girl, was exactly the same way of using think as we do with people. And so that was enough to make you say, what, this has accelerated beyond my comfort level? I suddenly realized maybe they already are better, and making them more like real neural nets isn't the point. They're already better than us. They're a better way of doing learning. And if we make them bigger, 
they'll get much smarter than us. They already know more than any one person. I, I understand that things could go awry, but I still think that people hear the notion of danger and they dismiss it as hyperbole. I thought it was hyperbole for a long time because I thought these things were a long way off. I thought there will eventually be danger, but I thought um, focusing on it now is unnecessary because it'll be 30 to 50 years before these things get more intelligent than us. But this combination of realizing that they might have a much better way of learning than we have, because they can share knowledge instantly, and seeing things like ChatGPT or Palm at Google that can explain why a joke is funny, made me realize these things are already pretty intelligent, and if they've got a better form of intelligence than ours, then it gets to be much more urgent. Probably still hard to see the threat, right? Some changes are clear. As ChatGPT, for example, gets smarter, as AI gets more advanced, yes, yeah, some jobs will disappear and some may shift. There can be pluses. For example, an AI doctor may have data from hundreds of millions of patients, so far more knowledge than an actual human. But what if that machine, that AI doctor, stops recommending treatment for people with a low chance of recovering? That can happen with humans too, but as machines learn and supersede human learning, it is the unintended consequences that haunt. Can we give these machines a, a moral code, a, a code of ethics? You can't um, kill people, you can't hurt people. It would be nice if we could do that, but just remember that one of the main players in developing these machines is defense departments. Mm. And defense departments, I mean, Isaac Asimov said, if you make a smart robot, the first rule should be, do not harm people. Well, I don't think that's gonna be the first rule in a robot soldier produced by a defense department. Right. But is there not some language we can give them so that they can police themselves? How does it work out when things police themselves? Yeah, not well. Where's your mind going in this conversation? Is it going to that terrible place of past creations that threatened humanity? The nuclear bomb, for example. It's not a bad example because it's so terrified that fear motivated a type of global togetherness, treaties that have kept the threat at bay until now. This, says Hinton, is that. Was this not where we say, China, Russia, we, we can't stand each other. They, they, all these countries, they're, they're angry, but we, we have a, a common concern. Exactly, for the super intelligence is taking over, not for all the other things, but for that, we're all in the same boat. It's like a global nuclear war. We all lose. And so that's the situation in which warring tribes cooperate. An external enemy that's bigger than them will force them to cooperate because they get the same payoff as each other. And so this threat is like that. Do you think China understands that? Yes. What, what makes you think that? There's researchers in China who are talking about this. Do the Americans understand it? They're beginning to, I think, yes. Senior political leaders in the States are paying attention now, and they're getting very interested in... So it's not just things like fakes and job losses, which are these sort of immediate concerns. They're also becoming interested in this existential threat of how do we stop these things taking over? The White House is indeed talking about a moral obligation for tech companies to consider the risks of AI, not just the benefits. Where the planet agrees on so little, just maybe it can agree on this. If by chance you're wondering how long it could be until Hinton's concerns materialize, he says somewhere between five and 20 years. Meanwhile, his former employer looks like it is doubling down on artificial intelligence. Just today, Google announced an extended AI rollout, including plans to use the tech in its search engine. Next, hospitals grappling with staff shortages are turning to private agencies to fill the gap. I either put my patients at risk, my staff at risk, or I pay $300 an hour. The surging costs of care, next. We are in the middle of a healthcare staffing crisis in this country. Fed up and burned out workers, especially nurses, 
are leaving their posts inside hospitals. This has forced emergency rooms to close and ORs to go dark. But some of those workers, including nurses, are coming back through private agencies. They're being hired at a huge cost to a healthcare system that can ill afford it, and to the detriment of public nurses who do the same job for less money. Christine Birak was granted access to an Ontario hospital that's using both, and she saw firsthand some of the frustration. A growing number of healthcare workers are being paid two, three, even four times more than others by the same hospital to do the exact same job working side by side. Including Basil Byfield and Keon Johnson. Both are highly skilled emergency room nurses. I've always loved the marriage. I've done it for over 30 years. Byfield works in the public system, caring for patients at Oak Valley Health's Markham Stouffville Hospital. It can be demoralizing for the, um, the regular staff, having to do the same job but getting you know, less pay. I've been working with the agency for seven years. Johnson left her full-time hospital job. With three kids, she says her work schedule was grueling. Johnson's now studying to become a nurse practitioner. Working for a private nursing agency allows her to choose her own hours. With the agency, the primary impetus would be, of course, the flexibility that it provides, as well as the financial increase. All of the units at the hospital will tell us how many nurses they need. And there's no shortage of work. For today it's four, but moving forward to Saturday, a day 12 or a night 12, 24-hour period, I need over 20 nurses to fill the gaps. That's, That's daunting. Terry Stewart McEwen was a nurse for 38 years. She's now the chief nursing executive at Oak Valley. As an organization, you're saying I either put my patients at risk, my staff at risk, or I pay $300 an hour. And that's what we all had to play out across the province. You heard that right, $300 an hour to hire a nurse. Private for-profit agencies call it surge pricing, kind of like Uber. The higher the demand, the higher the price. Other agencies charge between $75 and $150 an hour. Public hospital staff nurses make around $40. Last year, uh, we spent over, in this organization, $4 million. And we are a medium-sized organization. You can imagine adding that times all of the hospitals. That's a huge cost to our healthcare systems. Most provinces are now paying millions more for the same workers. In Quebec, the numbers are eye-popping. The province's use of private staffing agencies cost taxpayers nearly a billion dollars last year, three billion since 2016. Now Quebec's health minister wants change. It's costing a lot. You've seen the cost of that, that doesn't make sense. Quebec recently passed a bill limiting the use of private health agencies. The goal is to ban hospitals from using them by the end of 2025. This has been a crisis that nurses have been warning about for 20 years now, at the very least. Nathalie Steak Doucette was a nurse for over a decade. She now teaches nursing at McGill. She says private health care staffing agencies are like vultures, but they're a symptom of a deeper problem. The private agencies are taking advantage of the fact that our healthcare system is a meat grinder for nurses. Burnout, the lowest wages in the country, and punishing work hours, including forced overtime in Quebec, led to healthcare workers fleeing public hospitals. Quebec's now promising it will become the employer of choice once again. Steak Doucette is somewhat optimistic. I would go back if I knew that there'd be safe ratios. Studies show having enough nurses to care for patients saves lives. There are fewer medication errors and staff can spend more time with patients and their families. When you leave at the end of the day, you know, I mean, you, you mourn with people, you cry with them, you... Experience there. Some fear other provinces aren't learning from Quebec's mistakes, including Ontario, which fought public sector nurses over wages and plans to expand private for-profit surgery clinics. We try our very best to care for people. I feel like we're not respected in the sense that our needs are not being met. Until they are, taxpayers will continue paying into private agency profits. 
instead of investing in public health care systems desperately in need of help. Christine, is, is getting rid of the temp agencies even doable? All the nurses we spoke with don't think so. They also said these agencies are predatory. They're no utopia, but some of them have been around for decades. It's just they never offered steady work until now. They're businesses. They're seeing big money to be made. Hospitals need these workers back. It is life or death. So if provinces want to put these agencies out of business, they're going to need to figure out how they're going to hold on to the healthcare workers they still have and how they're going to recruit new ones. But how are they going to do that? Well, different provinces are taking different approaches. Nova Scotia recently announced it'll give nurses $10,000 signing bonuses with conditions. But British Columbia is really leading the way here. It's the first province to adopt nurse-to-patient ratios. And when you think about the millions, even billions that are being spent, hiring more nurses and improving working conditions makes sense financially and for patients. All right, Christine Birek, as always, thank you. You're welcome. Next, an NHL player's heartfelt response to an insensitive remark. I carry my grandfather's last name and I'm, nothing makes me more proud than to, to be able to do that. The emotional defense of his heritage in our moment. A new study is raising new concerns about the long-term health of some NHL players, specifically enforcers. Cameron McIntosh now on the lasting impacts associated with fighting on the ice. This is how it starts. They say there's no fighting in the playoffs. Tell that to Vegas and Edmonton. They've been going at it. Now, new warnings about the long-term risks. What we found shocked us. Dr. Charlie Popkin is a surgeon at Columbia University and a doctor with USA Hockey. He compared long-term health data of enforcers, players with 50 or more fights, and other NHL players over 55 years. And what we found was in both of those groups, the enforcers were dying a decade earlier than their peers and more likely to die from suicide or drug overdose. In 2011, the overdose death of Derek Bugard, suicide of Rick Rippon, and suspected suicide of Wade Belak, all NHL heavyweights, posed big questions for hockey. Um, but this is the first study to actually systematically review how different their causes of death are than hockey players who weren't involved in a lot of fights. Dr. Chris Nowinski says the findings support links to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, a brain condition believed to be linked to repeated blows to the head. Things that we associate with CTE, right? We have suicides, we have drug overdoses, uh, automobile accidents uh, for risk-taking behaviors. Other than some anecdotal evidence, there has not been that a conclusive link. The NHL has yet to acknowledge CTE, but fighting is down, about 77% since 2000. The game today is faster, requires more skill. I think that also plays a huge role in why we're seeing the role of the enforcer kind of die out the way that it has. Still says one of Canada's leading concussion experts, the NHL can do more. There's too much risk-taking behavior and it's causing brain Damage. The NHL didn't respond to a request for comment, while the NHL Players Association says it's looking at the study. Meanwhile, in the heat of the playoffs, it's bound to get rough. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Hands to White Cloud with some room, moves in, shoots, SCORE! The Golden Knights, Zach White Cloud is no stranger to an on-ice scrap. What the player from Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation is not used to is getting mocked for his name by a broadcaster. But that's exactly what happened when an ESPN anchor made a bad joke during a game earlier this week. The NHL player's emotional and compassionate response is our moment. Hands to White Cloud with some room, moves in, shoots, score! And I had a conversation with John this morning. He offered um, his apology um, and explained uh, his his uh, side of, of uh, obviously what occurred last night, it was an attempt at humor that came out as being obviously insensitive. I'm proud of my culture, I'm proud of, of where I come from, where I was raised. I carry my grandfather's last name and I'm, nothing makes me more proud than to, to be able to do that. I believe he was sincere in his apology and I was going to be the first person to reach out my hand and offer... Uh, just to offer help. 
because uh, people make mistakes, right? And, and uh, it's just a time for everyone to learn. Lots of reasons to be proud of Zach as a man, as a hockey player. The Sioux Valley Dakota Nation has been supporting him throughout his entire career. If you want to watch him play, he's playing tonight, Vegas against the Edmonton Oilers. That is national from 8 to 10. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.